Hi, I'm Christine. I'm a U.S. citizen, and Lafayette is the sixth country I've lived in. So, uh, yes, and my name is Rob. Rob Nichols. Uh, Christine's my wife. I'm her husband. Uh, we came to the EU uh, uh, five years ago, and we've been in Latvia for the past uh, three. Hey, hey. Hi. Hi. How are y'all? Good. Great. It's a, it's a nice weekend and we're looking forward to some culture events this weekend, so. Excellent. She's, she's looking forward to culture events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're well, doing we'll... The, we're doing the white night tonight and then uh, tomorrow we're going to the open air museum for the big craft show, so should be fun. Excellent. Yeah, we'll get into talking about what uh, you've been up to in Riga, both together and separately. And you two have the honor of being our very first couple interview. So this will be fun. I think it will be really interesting <laughs> to see both, you know, what things, especially in your journey together, what things are similar and what things are different. And yeah, just get double the fun, double the perspective. So let's jump straight in to tell us a little bit about where each of you are from and what that place is like. I was born and raised in the state of Missouri in the United States, a uh, small town of Harrisonville. It's about 6,000 people, uh, 40 miles south of Kansas City. And yeah, small rural town, mother was a, a school teacher, dad was a meter reader for the gas service company up in, in Kansas City. Um, grew up there, went to school there. It was a farm too. So. Yeah, well, 40 acres, wasn't really a, a farm farm to me. We, we didn't grow crops, but we did have uh, different livestock depending on the time period. Um, dad, when I was growing up, dad uh, showed horses, then he trained racehorses uh, in addition to his quote unquote real job because he was born a farmer boy and you had to do farm things. Mm -hmm. um, and then he moved on to cattle uh in high school i was in the future farmers of america i had raised pigs for like three four years um saw right away that i did not want to do that for a living um and yeah went to college at northwest missouri state university which was in the northwest corner of the state and after that, went to work for the state government of, of Missouri. So I lived in the capital, Jefferson City, for, for a while. Um, yeah, basically not very exciting, uh, but my passion was always gaming. And I had an opportunity to turn games into from my hobby into my career and that's what led me to chicago so i started working for various companies in chicago uh, around 1996 as i date myself um <laughs> and that is where i eventually met christine so your turn um okay so i said mine's a little longer um i was born in ohio uh, state of ohio in the united states uh, I, my family was there um, until I was 18 months old, and then we moved to Egypt for a year and a half, and then or Cairo, Egypt, and then we went uh, to Nicosia, Cyprus, and we lived there until I was eight years old, and then we moved from Nicosia, Cyprus to South Carolina, the state of South Carolina in the United States, and I went to middle school, high school, and college in South Carolina. And then after college, um, I moved to Chicago, where eventually I met this weird dude. So <laughs> did, did I know him? Did we meet? 
you did know him. You didn't like him very much. <laughs> so, but yeah, so that's, um, so uh, even before we lived here, uh, as a kid, uh, my family had lived in several different countries. So I actually sort of, first half of my life, I was not spent in the U.S. Very interesting. Yeah, and, and I had never gone outside the continental U.S. Uh, prior to uh, part of work once I got up into Chicago. So it sounds like the two of you in some ways had like a almost opposite, if you want to call it that, upbringing where one of you was in one, sp one space in one place in a very rural place and the, uh, the other was, you know, bopping around in different places um, until you kind of eventually came together. Yep. And Rob, you brought up a really good point around this idea of where you're from. Um, and this, this simple question, where are you from, can be really complex for a lot of people um, and difficult for them to, to answer. And so you said you don't consider yourself from Missouri, even though you lived there for the first part of your life. So talk about where you consider yourself from and, and why you kind of choose that, if, if you can kind of go into that a little bit. To answer the question about where I consider myself from, I would honestly say from Chicago. Um, that is where I feel like, you know, even after I'd been grown up and high school and everything else, Chicago is where I started actually doing what I really wanted to as far as a career and met a lot of, you know, people I still hang out with and consider very close friends. So, you know, Chicago is more of where I'm from. And I spent just about as many years there as I did in, uh, in Missouri. So, um, yeah, Chicago, Illinois, third, third largest city in the United States, um, huge, I, I have learned about, you know, uh, gridlock and traffic jams and, you know, how uh, much, how important public transportation can be if it's run well, but just the sheer amount of museums and restaurants and theaters and all kinds of things. It was very opening for a guy who hadn't had, you know, Chinese food until college. So, you know, um, so I would definitely consider myself from Chicago. Yeah, it sounds like you became you there. Yes, that's very, that's very true. Yeah, excellent. And, and similarly for you, Christine, how do you, how do you think about this idea of where you're from? Um, given um, that you bounced all over the place also as a kid, how do you answer that question? It's a weird question. question. Um, if it's just a very quick conversation, you know, um, I could say like SS Mill Mill, uh, say, uh, no Chicago, so from Chicago, just because it's the quickest summary of where I am, but um, I would say I'm from the planet Earth because there's not really one country and all of the countries we lived in really and all, you know, all the places we lived in really had an influence on who I am now. So I, I, I like I say, I say Chicago for a quick answer, but if people want more details, then I go into the whole spill of different countries. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I, I, I find that question fascinating because I also have answered it differently depending on where I've lived, who I'm talking to, how much I want to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, and the nice thing with Chicago is most people have heard of it. So mm -hmm. it's also very easy to give the like, oh, yeah, I'm from Chicago and they get a general idea. Like most people have heard of it. They may not know a lot of details, but it, it kind of gives them an idea where in the U.S. you know, we we're from before. Whereas like if you say a more minor city, it's it's yeah. So usually Chicago's the quick and easy answer, quick, easy and dirty answer. <laughs> so <laughs> excellent. Um and did 
you two end up going abroad, um, living abroad after your childhood, Christine, um, for the first time when you were already together? Yes. Yes. Okay. And how did that come about? So I did travel some when I was in college, um, but travel, not live. And then uh, we were living in Chicago. And uh, to be frank, um, I had some serious health issues that um, included me having some vision issues and not being able to see, being very sick. And that honestly led to very serious uh, money issues in the U.S. Uh, Rob wasn't, was having trouble finding work. I couldn't work because I couldn't see, and I'm a programmer, so it's hard to program when you can't see. Um, so, and that, and if anyone's not familiar with the U.S. healthcare system, it's very, very costly. So, particularly if any type of chronic illness, um, I did eventually have eye surgery, which allowed me to see again and 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 be a lot better. But after that, we had a huge pile of medical debt. And at that point, Rob got the job offer for a job in Germany. And you want to explain how that went? <laughs> so, yeah, um, it, 2013 is when this happened and it was just not a good year for us. Um, Cause we, we had gotten together, we had gotten married, we had gotten a house together. We were, you know, making payments and everything. Um, this, and then, you know, we actually got the house right before the 2008 crash. Mm. And so we were underwater, but we were still making payments and, and everything, um, got married. And then 2013 came along and the place I had been working for eight years, the longest I'd ever been anywhere and thought was going to be the home. They went through some bad times and, you know, cut like 20% of the, the staff. And being a senior guy in the US, you're usually the first one to go. Um, but we were getting along okay on Christine's salary, but then she started having this eye problem and couldn't work. And I was looking, but you know, things just didn't work out uh, very well. Uh, thank goodness for Obamacare, at least. And the fact that I had, you know, we had both built up some retirement, but we basically blew through that to sustain ourselves and to pay medical insurance and, and things like that. Um, but things started to turn around. Uh, I was applying everywhere. I had actually started applying for jobs outside of the gaming industry again. And uh, lo and behold, there was a company in Hamburg, Germany that was looking for a game designer. And I applied, I interviewed over, you know, online and everything, and they made an offer and it was really good. Now it was supposed to be just for a year, but it was for uh, free-to-play games, which I didn't have any experience for. And this was the thing that was shutting a lot of doors for me. So uh, as you heard, my world traveler wife, I went to her and I said, so could you stand living in Germany for a year? Yes. You don't want to <laughs> think about it? No. <laughs> so yeah, uh, took the job. And she, like I said, had been having her, her surgery and it was, it was just time just right that she was, had her surgery and was better. And then I was going to, you know, move to Hamburg and then she was like in six months going to join me. So uh, it all really worked out. Yeah, so, I so, had to sell the house. So I had to put everything mm. in storage and, you know, luckily we had very her best friends that are yeah we had very some tall, very, very helpful good friends who helped me pack up our house and then we could put it um you know uh we were yeah we were having issues with like I said the the mortgage on our house so um so we were able to clear out the house put everything in storage and then we figured well, well spend a year in Germany see what happens um and at that time also funny enough uh I took a 
three month contract job for a programming because I figured, well, why I'm cleaning up the house, I can also get some extra cash before I move to Germany. Um, and that one actually was after five months, I went to them and said, so I'm moving to Germany in a month. Um, <laughs> I can either keep working for you or I can quit, but I'm moving to Germany in a month. And um, they had said I was the most competent programmer they've ever had. So they agreed to let me work remote. And honestly, I've been working for them for five years now. So yeah, a five month job turned into five years. It's so. fascinating how things can, um, I mean, I think it's too simple to say things fall into place, but it's fascinating how unexpected you think things are going to be one way and, and they end up another way because Rob, it, it doesn't sound like you intentionally were applying to places abroad. You just kind of happened upon right. this really right for you job that happened to be abroad. Yeah, and uh, I was desperate <laughs> enough that I was I was willing to you know go outside the box. And like I said, I was applying for jobs I probably normally wouldn't have. But yeah. So this, this actually worked out. It's one of so. those things like, you know, always apply for the job. You never know. I mean, worst they can yeah. do is say no. You and know. I, I had been told no a lot. So that was, that was fine. But uh, so, yeah. Um, so he went to Germany in 2015. Um, I joined him in April 2016. Um, and then ever having the health issues. Uh, immediately my first day in Germany, I... Uh, immediately my first day in Germany, I promptly broke my leg because I'm a klutz. And um, <laughs> it's, it's just facts. Um, and so I, so this is the story of how I broke my, my ankle. Um, and this is part of why we, the reason I'm telling is part of the reason we've had, uh, we've chosen to remain in Europe. Um, so I was in Amsterdam with a friend, uh, carrying down suitcases down a set of stairs with no railing and fell down the stairs and concrete like, wow. stairs she could have cracked her head open <laughs> yeah but ankle hurt but i iced it and i was like well we're running to Amsterdam for the day and tomorrow we're taking the train to hamburg so leah why don't you that's my friend i was traveling with why don't you spend the day going around Amsterdam? i'm gonna stay in the hotel and you know just keep my ankle elevated and iced and uh, the next day, wrapped it real well. I was like, well, it still kind of hurts, but I think I'll be well enough. So we got on the train and took the train from, from Amsterdam, Netherlands to Hamburg, Germany. The only thing was uh, I did ask Rob to meet us. We were switching at one station, switching trains. So I was like, can you meet us to help us with suitcases? Because I had a bunch of bags since I was moving to Germany. Mm -hmm. And so Leah you know, was there and Rob, they met us. and. I limped along and then we got to Hamburg and we took a taxi from the train station to our apartment, which was on the fourth floor. So <laughs> that was fun. And then um, we got to, you know, we, we dropped off the bags. And then at that point I was like, yeah, this is still, my ankle's still kind of hurting. Maybe we should go to ER and get an x-ray. I mean, I don't think it's broken, but because it would hurt more, but you know, and then Rob said, well, do you want to take a taxi? Or you want to take the bus? I'm like, it's not that painful. So we'll just take the bus. It's fine. <laughs> and we went to the ER. Now, first day in Germany. So I didn't, I wasn't on Rob's insurance at this point. And um, so we go to the ER, the x-ray at and it's it's broken. It's a spiral fracture. Going it's, to have to have. It's not just a simple break. It <laughs> is a fracture that goes around the bone. So. And so I'm going to have to have surgery. They're going to have to put a plate in. You know, install a plate in the ankle. Might have also torn the ligament. They'll have to see when they do surgery. And we we're just like, okay. And. But the crazy thing is being from the US, we were like, oh, how much is you know ER gonna be? Because in the US, a visit like that could easily be five thousand dollars. Now, wait, 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 wait. So so she has a surgery, major surgery. Well, I was gonna get to that. So so the ER visit with me not being insured, first day in Germany was a hundred euros. Hundred and fifty, oh. but yeah. No, 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 it was a hundred euros. I remember it was a hundred euros. 
um, that was for medication, diagnosis, and so and crutches. They provided crutches for me as well, which in the U.S. they don't do. So that was we were like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, hundred euros for this, and in the U.S. it would have been crazy expensive. Then on Monday he was able to sign me up for his insurance. And so I'm now on German insurance and I got the surgery within a week. Um, so anybody who says that there's wait times, it's not true. Um, so went in for the surgery. It was seven days in the hospital, uh, surgery in my ankle. They also provided a wheelchair because they had me trying crutches and quickly came to the conclusion I'm a klutz. So <laughs> they provided me a wheelchair because my ligament was torn and I couldn't put any weight on my ankle on my foot for two months. So all of that. So Rob goes to pay the bill for my hosp my seven day hospital stay, which in the U.S. would have been probably 10,000. Well, no, 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 no. It would have easily been $50,000 or more, something like that. Um, and I am I am like, God, I hope they take you know, installments and a payment plan and all of this stuff. And the woman looks at me and I explain, I'm here to pay the bill, blah, blah. And she says, that'll be 70 euros. And I'm like, 70,000 euros? And she looks at me like I'm an insane and just says, no, 70, seven, zero. And I think I'm on candid camera. I'm like, where? Where are the hidden cameras? <laughs> My wife had surgery. She was in the hospital for a week. This would easily be, you know, huge medical bills that, that you know, we were still paying off for her eye surgery and, and things like that. Nope, 70 euros, done, out. And I was just like, oh my God. I seriously walked around like, like stunned <laughs> for easily a week. And it was like that repeatedly in Germany. Um, there was a day where I wasn't feeling well, went into the doctor um, because I had been here six months. I had already like kind of scouted the land and had stuff arranged and, and things like that. Knew where the hospital was. Uh, I went into the doctor in Hamburg and she said, yeah, you've got, this was like on a, on a Thursday or a Wednesday. And she said, yeah, you've caught this bug. It's going around. I'm going to write you a note, stay home, get, get better. And I'm like, you're going to give me a medical note to stay home. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, you realize in the U S I would be dying in order to get one of these notes. And they're just like, nope, here you go. No big deal. Called work, said I had a doctor's note. They're like, okay, great. See you on Monday. It's like, what? I had decades under the American system that just short circuiting my brain. So yeah, she's she's not kidding when when medical was one of the reasons when uh, well, the job was, ended in Hamburg. We wanted to stay in Europe. There was even experience when I was working for um, one large bank of, I literally went to the ER. I was so sick from a virus. And and there this was like on a Wednesday. And the, the doctor's like, well, I'm going to give you a note for Thursday and Friday or Thursday. And I was like, can you do Friday as well? So I can have the weekend to rest up. And even then my work was like, so can you be in on Friday? Yeah, I was literally emailing them from the ER and they're like, so are you gonna you're you talking about the US. Yeah, this was in the US. I was literally mm -hmm. emailing my boss from the ER and he's like, can you be here the day after tomorrow? And I'm like, I'm in the ER. <laughs> you know? So that was, um, yeah, it's, it's there, there are issues like that. So we spent, he spent a year and a half in Germany and then, um, and I spent a year because I joined him, you know, within six months. And we, like I said, the medical care, we're like, wait, you don't want people to come to work sick and get everyone else sick and have everyone just work through it and healthcare is affordable. It was, uh, it was very, very yeah. different. So, um, so we 
we decided we really like being in Europe. And then unfortunately, he's in the gaming industry, so layoffs happen a lot. Um, he got uh, laid off and started looking for a new job. He got an offer in Eindhoven, Netherlands. So we spent a year there. And again, to bring up the, the medical history, um, I had to have the plate removed while I was in the Netherlands. And I went to the doctor and they're like, okay, yeah. They said, now you're gonna be put on a wait list because this is not you know, urgent. And I'm like, that's fine, you know, it's not. And whenever you can fit me in. And they said it could be a month or two within a week. With like, I think it was two weeks. They were like, okay, you wanna come in for the surgery? I'm like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so again, the wait times are not, at least in our experience in the Netherlands, the wait times weren't horrible. Uh, they were great, actually, better than I had experienced sometimes in the U.S. And um, so, yeah, we and then we spent a year in the Eindhoven, Netherlands, and uh, then he got um, a job offer for Riga. So I'll let him explain <laughs> that. Well, uh, I do want to uh, talk about just a little bit. Uh, so when I moved to Germany, this was a big thing for me. Uh, yeah. I had previously to that, uh, I had worked for a company that had headquarters in Bordeaux, France, and another office in Moscow. And they sent me out and I spent like four days in Bordeaux and ended up two weeks in Moscow in February. So you talk about uh, thick black slippery ice, <laughs> but that was my experience, you know, very short, short term out somewhere else back to the US. Now I was living, you know, someplace else and Hamburg, fortunately, a lot of places understood English, a lot of people, but, you know, all the signs are in German, uh, all the products, you know, I can't just get everything like I can in the US. Um, one of the first things I determined to do was have a, a German McDonald's hamburger just to see what the differences were. And oh my God, it was so much better. Um, <laughs> found out that the EU has certain requirements and like the, the chicken has to be real chicken, not, you know, chicken pieces that sort of thing. And so, yeah, food turns out so much better quality here in the, in the EU or, you know, than, than I remember in the US. Um, you know, finding out things like uh, just the size portion differences uh, in the US, everything is huge, um, not so much here. You know, they're actually reasonable size. Uh, the fact that things are smaller, like we're used to having all this space, but apartments much smaller, the refrigerators much smaller. Um, you don't always have washer dryer in the unit and even then it's not full sized. So, um, yeah, just a lot of adjustments. Um, uh, and language, of course, is a big one. Uh, Germany is where I, I learned that basically you conversationally day to day, there's really only a handful of words you need to know that will get you by like 80% of the time. Um, Hello, goodbye, please and thank you. Um, numbers, you know, starting off. Uh, so yeah, well, and that also, was- One of the Go things ahead. with Germany is, um, I actually took German, German in high school and college. So um, that was, so when I got there, like I actually speak a, you know, a little bit of German and that helped a lot, so. Um, and one of the big differences too, I think, is I remember, um, you know, when I was a kid living in a different country that didn't speak English, and it was definitely a much bigger challenge because these days, you know, you pull out your phone and use Google Translate, 
And that makes things so much easier. Whereas when you're a kid, <laughs> you know, when we were younger, when I was younger, we were just like, well, <laughs> We hope, <laughs> like we even ordering at a restaurant, like here, if the menu's not in English, you pull out your phone, you translate, you figure out what you want. There, there was a lot of adventures on ordering food because we had no idea what we were getting. So, um, so that was definitely one big difference these days living as an expat versus uh, before technology was so prevalent is just the language barrier was much more significant and trying to navigate your way, even driving around like Cyprus, when you might end up in a little village where no one speaks English and there are goats running across the road for hours. And well, that's the adventure versus here, you have Google Maps. And so it definitely makes things a lot freer, to me at least. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, one kind of side question, but related to, to you two talking about coming to Germany for the first time and it being really new for you, Rob, um, especially, is were there things either then or kind of in your journey between all these countries that where you kind of realized things about you that felt American that maybe you didn't notice as much back in the States? Like I remember when I moved, there were things that I noticed that I had never thought about um, where I said, wow, this part of me is really used to how this is done in the U.S. or how people react to this in the U.S. or just even parts of my personality and, and how I present myself. So were there certain things that you noticed that you were like, this is well, really there was, American. There was one thing I was informed about uh, early on <clears throat> was that uh, they they make jokes about the loud American. Well, I was the loud American because I was I had I didn't try to stay quiet. I would laugh at things and have a very big booming laugh, um, which apparently could be heard throughout my office and I was later told that after the first week I was actually you know they were cons well the the boss was considering firing me because he thought this guy's so loud and rude and it's like no this is just how you know Americans are so even now for at a restaurant sometimes I have to be like lower the voice yeah. are up we're <laughs> you're getting loud yeah. so he's very yeah I mean he, sometimes he doesn't realize just quite how loud he, he is so yeah and even to this day after living abroad for five years I still have to remember that things I do and say that would just be considered either normal or a joke in the U.S can be taken very seriously, you know, elsewhere. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I've, it, it's made me think a lot about how I relate to other people mm -hmm. um, and, and figuring out when and how to adjust to kind of the cultural norms, but also how to maintain a sense of I'm, you know, uh, yeah, it's even, it's hard for me to get out. Right. How to, how to respect cultural norms, but also still be yourself. You know, I, yeah. I still think I'm much more friendly and outgoing than maybe is the cultural norm and realizing that that may also be appreciated, <laughs> but not deviating so much that I, frighten small children and and everyone on the right. street yeah so at least with that with friendliness with kids has been fine um i know adults like yeah there's definitely a you don't smile at people but that's also very similar to chicago like you don't smile at people so and you don't talk to people on the train <laughs> so that wasn't as much of a culture shock for me at least as like well that's you don't talk to people on train well, <laughs> so and and that is another thing I have had to come to terms with because okay in the U.S. you're supposed to be polite 
um, even to people you don't know and, you know, polite, friendly, et cetera. And here that's considered fake and it puts people off. So they're like, why are you sucking up to me? Why are you being so friendly? Even though for me, I think I'm just being nice, you know? And so I have learned to tone it down a bit when I first meet people and try not to, to do that right away so that hopefully it, I can be more genuine later on when they, you know, get to know me better. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's, that's a great point. So there are a couple of things that you two are making me think about, <laughs> and I'm trying to organize my thoughts here. So one, one part is around connection. So Christine, you talking about, about kids, I, I've also channeled some of my need to smile at things and, and interact with things at dogs. I've found that people you know, allow me to, to smile at their dogs and they appreciate it. Um, you can kind of see that they appreciate it sometimes. Um, and it makes me think of this idea of sometimes when you can find a commonality with folks that are local, you have this bridge that you can, you know, at least briefly interact, but sometimes also develop relationships were there things for the two of you, again, along any part of your journey that you found for yourself in particular helped you to connect to the place that you were in or to the people that were the language? in? language? Mm -hmm. Trying to, um, really, that's been one of the biggest things is even if you're really bad at it, try showing that you're making the effort to learn the language. Um, whether it was German, like we were in a restaurant in Germany and the waitress was literally teaching us the German words for the, you know, utensils, the forks and knives and stuff. Um, that really felt like it opened um, doors, I would guess you say, metaphor, you know, it, in that, and like when in the Netherlands, like just trying to even speak Dutch, being able to say Danke wel, um, and then here certainly trying to show that you're making the effort. Like I go to a pet store regularly and, you know, I, she sees that I'm trying to say the, the number in Latvian and she corrects me, which is great because I need help, but it, she seems to be really appreciative of me trying to make that effort. So I think that's one of the things, even if you're really, really bad at it, it just trying to make that effort of learning the local language really seems to make locals appreciate that you're not, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, like I said, it's definitely only the language has been uh, a huge, uh, I, I would, I, I would recommend if you're going to spend more than a week in any country, and even if you're going to spend a week, learn the local word for like, thank you. I mean, being able to say thank you in, in the language, it, it they, it, at least you made that effort. And that really does seem to take you a lot farther. So. Yeah. And, and like I said, um, <clears throat> been here in, in Latvia for uh, uh, two years, almost three. And uh, I know 10, 15 words, even after the course, it's just, you know, the older you are, the harder it is to mm -hmm. sink in. And honestly, most of uh, my conversations with shopkeepers, waiters, waitstaff, taxi drivers, those 15 words are enough. So, you know, it works out. And why not put that effort? You're, you're a guest in their country. So, yeah. Yeah. And particularly like you are a guest and we feel like we're guests here. And, the, and so it seems respectful to the very least to try to learn the language. I mean, it is not easy. Like Latvian it's a very interesting language because of the yeah. age and and, the, <laughs> and there's no word for the which was to learn German with three words mm. of three mm -hmm. versions and English just has one and there's none in Latvian. like it, it is a it's definitely um interesting challenge but yeah I I would always recommend trying to I mean at least make the effort I mean it it doesn't ever I've never regretted or feel wasted in trying to learn some of the language so so yeah, um, basically our time in, in Europe has been, uh, as long as we have good internet, 
she can work wherever because she works for the company in Chicago. And my, just by the nature of my industry, I have to have good, you know, be in places with good internet. And so, yeah, came to Latvia for a startup and it unfortunately didn't go well. Um, but financial issues, it was a startup. Yeah. So. <clears throat> um, but now I work for, you know, one of the largest uh, companies in Latvia and it's a leader in its field. And so, you know, feel pretty secure uh, with that. So probably we'll be here for a while. And yeah, you talk about bureaucracy when, when I was with the startup, very limited staff had to, you know, do a lot of the paperwork for my, my visa personally. Mm. Mm. And that was a challenge. I mean, yes, had a native who would go with me to talk to, to people and things like that. But yeah. Whereas with the large company, it was just like, oh yeah, show up on this date and, you know, we'll fill out all the forms. We'll do all the, the rest of the stuff. You basically just need to show up and very, very different, you know, experience that way. Um, I would say, you know, when people ask me, uh, if we like Latvia, if we like Riga, say my wife and I love it, even though it's much smaller than Chicago, it feels like Chicago in miniature, um, still have a rush hour, still have traffic jams. It's not as uh, bad. Because I, they're well again it's in miniature. miniature. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because rush hour in, in Chicago was start at like five a.m. I would say, whereas here it's more like eight a.m. So definitely a little better. But there's yeah, there's definitely a lot of similarities. I mean, there's good and bad. Like weather is very yeah. similar. I think Chicago is a little colder. Like at least in our experience, the last three years, like I definitely had experienced a lot more snow and a lot colder temperatures in Chicago than we have here. Um, the, um, the, but there's also a lot of very things I love, like the culture, you know, all the different events. Uh, one Museums, of the things, I, yeah. And honestly, one of the things I do love here is a lot of these events are either free or fairly cheap. Like we've gone to concerts and it's only like 10 euros for like a concert at the Riga Domus with the big organ. And in Chicago, that would be $50. So I like that a lot of them sure is cost of living, but mm. there's a lot more free things to do. It feels like here, but, and there's, <coughs> I love all the museums. I love all, like I said, just the culture, the performances, cause I really love uh, orchestra performances. So that are um, opera, ballet, like these, that's one of the things we really love about living here. Um, but there's also, you know, the negative, like the corruption, honestly, equally as bad. Chicago and Riga sometimes like uh, corruption of government officials, ah. you know. <laughs> and are you <laughs> commenting on that from stories you've heard, things you've read, personally experiences? Uh, stories mostly. Yeah. We, we don't hang out with, you know, either either there or here. We don't typically hang out with, you know, high level politicians, but um, it is true that the state of Illinois, where Chicago is located, if you become governor of Illinois, you have like a 30 percent uh, greater chance or likelihood of going to prison than governor of any other state in the U.S. Two and, of the past three governors have ended up in jail. So for corruption. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> again, we've we've heard stories here. So, you know, um, just is. Uh, again, good wise, there's a lot, like she said, there's a lot of culture, a lot of museums. Uh, the food is great. There's a wide variety and uh, grocery shopping was a big adjustment. So, and I, I had always been used to having a car. And when I got to Hamburg, I learned that public transportation was good enough <clears throat> and so I came out of the store with these big bags and everything. And I said, oh, crap, 
I don't have a car to put this in. I had to manage, manhandle this all on the bus. And so I've since learned you don't, in America, you go shopping, you'd buy like two weeks worth at once, you take it home, you store it, freeze it, chill it, whatever. Here, no, you go every couple of days and you, you eat it. And when, you know, the milk either runs out or goes bad or the bread goes bad, you just go get fresh and it's fresher. It's better for you. It's not packed full of chemicals and preservatives and, and everything else like it is in the US. And so um, there isn't as much variety like in the US, they pride themselves on here's 40 different types of cereal, every type of cereal you can imagine, pick the one you want. Here there's five or six, but honestly you only need five or six really so yeah no lot lot lots of differences um well and then also i think one of the differences just as a kid is um definitely connections to people still in the u.s like it's lot so much easier now um we would have to we would have schedule a phone in Cyprus and Egypt is phone calls were even more challenging sometimes because the technology wasn't great. So sometimes trying to do phone calls didn't work out. But in Cyprus it was easier. We would do like every other week a phone call with my mom's parents. And it was maybe 15, 20 minutes because it was really, really expensive. Whereas like um, the other day, my mom video calls me and we chatted for like, you know, half hour, hour, whatever, and just chatted about, you know, random things. And it felt, phone calls then felt more like you need to get the necessary how things are going out um, and much more push to only talk about the essential stuff. Whereas now just video chatting with, with friends and stuff. Uh, we do regular gaming sessions online with friends and can be on, you know, video chats for hours with friends and that's a very different like the connections are much easier maintained than they were as a you know without the technology i think technology really made a big difference obviously with living abroad <clears throat> yeah i think in a way the my reaction to what you're saying the the thought that's going through my head at the moment is that we are able to be more global citizens now so we're able to be in a place and experience right. a place but also maintain friendships and maintain connections. And, and for the two of you, again, you've kind of bounced around different places um, and you can hold on to pieces of different places that you've lived. And um, at, at least for me, it's been really helpful, you know, both in terms of adjustment of, of living in a new place to have my, my support system and my old connections, but also it, it makes you, it makes me feel like I don't have to leave anything that I really want to hold on to because I can take that with me and I can do a little bit of that. And, and what kinds of things uh, do you think of when you think about the, the difference between the first time and especially for you, Rob, it was the first, first time, but for Christine, first time in a while, the first time you you moved abroad versus kind of going to your second country and going to the third place and how that either felt the same or felt different in terms of adjustment. I think it got easier. Yeah, um, I was going to say it definitely got easier. It wasn't the same. Because, um, yeah, trying to find things like setting up your internet, setting up, finding an apartment, stuff like that. The, Rob was, you know, did it by himself, um, never had lived outside of the US. And when we moved to the Netherlands, like it was easier to find. We, we'd gotten, we'd hooked into how, how to do this. And so even moving to Lafayette, like, again, you, it's a lot easier to, you learn how to find places much quicker, um, finding the, what's the grocery store, things like that. I think it gets easier with each country. So. Yeah, and you learn certain tricks, like, you know, coworkers are a big thing. Um, you ask, 
hey, do you have a doctor you would recommend? Do you, you know, where would you recommend to shop? Where's a good place to, you know, what's a good movie theater or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Your bank, like what bank Yeah, do you exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So stuff like that. Starting with your coworkers, it, they're a godsend because they're usually natives on the ground or have been there long enough that they can tell you. And, and even translations, like sometimes there yeah. are, yeah, things where you get mail and, you know, coworker will help you translate, so. Or notices are on the front door of the apartment. What does this mean? <laughs> you know, things like that. And so it also gets easier because when you you switch, you realize, okay, there there becomes a habit of I know I need to get my visa set up, I need to get an apartment, I need a bank account, I need this, I need that, and make sure that these things are covered and talked about in the interviews for the next job and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a good experience and I think, you know, you get better at it, so. That was one of the things as a kid is, my, it was my dad's company. He worked for NCR at the time as a mainframe programmer. And so when we lived in Egypt and Cyprus, they actually had someone local, the company would hire someone local to um, help my family find apartments, things like that. Whereas we've sort of done it on our own. Um, Though the one advantage my parents had is because my dad's mm -hmm. company moved him and it was also US based, like their taxes were a lot easier trying to sort out the, the, the company would just cover the taxes, local taxes, whereas we've had to uh, hire accountant in each country that we're in to make sure that we're paying our local taxes. And then we also have a US tax attorney to make sure that we're paying our US taxes. And so taxes have definitely been one of the most challenging parts about living abroad because as you said my butt yeah because living as US citizens we're still respond even though like Rob works for a Lafia company in Lafia he still owes US taxes on his salary earned here. So it's now the, the nice thing is that you know we've been in the EU so it's all related. There's treaties in place. So basically my uh the taxes I pay in the EU, in, in Latvia, in Eindhoven, in Hamburg, they count against my American taxes. The, the money I put into the social safety net here counts against my social security there. So, you know, it sort of balances out, but yeah. Yeah, and plus, yeah, but that is definitely one of the things to say, like having to have a local tax attorney plus get a translator to translate your tax documents from the local language to English for the IRS. Yeah, <laughs> that's definitely yeah. probably, I think that's probably the, maybe one of the, the harder things about being expat. I mean, being away from friends and family is probably the worst thing. Absolutely. Like you miss people constantly, but Probably, I think the second thing is the taxes. So one of the things I've seen is a lot of people have expressed frustrations with making friends with locals. And um, I would say expats are wonderful people to make friends with. Um, one of the problems is if you're local, you sort of have friends that you grew up with. You sort of have a built-in friend network. And whereas you move, and this is true no matter where you live, if you move there, you don't have that built-in people you've known for years. And particularly having um, spent time in these, you know, various countries, like expats are on the same, you know, no matter what country they're from, like there's that commonality of we're, uh -huh. we have no idea what's going on. We're doing the best we can, but we're here to, for new experiences. And, you know, that's been one of the things that I've been really grateful for here is we've made some really wonderful friends um, that, um, like from India and like some of our best friends here from India. From and the expat community. From the expat community. Right, and, yeah. and there's that shared, like, it doesn't matter that our backgrounds are different. Like there's that shared experience of we're, we're just here trying to figure it out and enjoy new experiences. And I love it because it, you get to learn about more, not just where you live, but also other countries that these that people are from so that i don't know i would say anybody's having trouble finding friends the 
the expats are the group to go with. So. Yeah, I mean, I have worked now for four different companies here in in the EU, and uh, I have acquaintances. I would say very few friends from those companies that I'm still in touch with or you know talk to uh, semi regularly. Um, but more of the expats were you know better friends, etc. I don't know why that is necessarily, other than you know work is a different environment, and that that's another big thing I love about here is in the US, you're supposed to sacrifice home for work. It's just work, 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 you know, throw yourself under the bus for us or we'll, you know, find somebody else that we can pay, <coughs> you know, half as much to get. And here it's like, no, take time off. Go, you know, go spend time with the friends and family. Don't, there, there is a work-life balance still which even to this day i still have trouble getting used to given all my years of experience in the u.s so yeah so do either of you have any final thoughts um i think honestly like i am been really grateful for the opportunities to live in different countries i i think our life is much richer for it you know so yeah, I would say if you if you can at all experience living in a different country, I recommend because whether you stay there forever, you're only there a year, like your life is going to be a lot richer for it. So I would tend to agree with that now. And I would say if you can find some crazy person willing to trek across, you know, several different countries with you, never knowing when you might end up back in the United States, uh, that is also a, a big thing to do because uh, I have the advantage of uh, no matter how strange or different the culture or the, the people or the situation may be, I bring a little bit of home with me wherever I go, a little bit of stability and, and God help me normalcy um to to you know keep me sane so there's definitely been times where we just you know when things are not going great we're looking at each other and go well it's an adventure and we say that to each other to remind ourselves that eh, it's an adventure we can figure it out you know yeah so. yeah what a what a perfect and summary for our first couple interview <laughs> that having that you know other person to 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 go through this with and and bounce things off of and have that support system is is really fantastic and um, it always feels like we only get a tiny slice of everybody's story but thank you so much for sharing um, hey, no problem. your your perspectives and uh, we'll check back in in the future. Sounds good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Hold this. <laughs>